Hey there digital world, it's Jordan here at Splicing Later and welcome back to another episode. Uh, apologies in advance if my voice gives out while we're recording this one. I have myself a little bit of a head cold. Nothing terrible, nothing to write home about. Uh, especially as it's here on a public holiday here in Australia on a three day weekend. Uh, and it's not like I had anywhere to be or anything to do. So I'll be all good uh, in the future. But uh, this is going to be a big episode today. So I have to prioritize doing it while I've got the time. Uh, it, it's annoying. Every time I do these rankings, I always seem to be a little unwell. It's almost like the universe is trying to tell me don't do them, uh, which you don't need to do universe because I'm already sort of doing that myself. But we're going to power on here at Spliced In Later. It's time for another ranking, uh, a nice little respite between the many reviews that I've done and the many reviews that are about to come. Today, we are doing the top 10 movies of 2010, a year that was 13 years ago. Uh, if you're new to the channel, if you're new to the Spotify, if you're new to whatever you're listening to, you're probably going, why is some guy ranking movies that came out 13 years ago? And I'm kind of with you on that. I think I understand the confusion. Uh, when I started out here on the show, it was uh, towards the end of 2019. So before I did my top 10 movies of that year, I did a top 10 movies of 2018, just to sort of get a feel for how I was going to present the movies, the the rankings, the honorable mentions, how I would talk about them, getting the, the, the its and outs sorted, mainly to figure out the timing as well, because no one wants to sit and listen to a ranking that goes for an hour. Uh, if you're on YouTube, maybe it's a little better if you've got one of those channels where they put up clips and things, but if you're on my YouTubes, it's just me talking, uh, and then maybe some movie posters popping up. And if you're on the Spotify, all you got is my voice. So uh, we started out that way, uh, and then to sort of spice things up, because we went into 2020, which is the notorious year of the lack of movies and things new to talk about, uh, I did some more rankings. I went further back in time, 2017, 2016, 2015, all of that. Uh, and in the middle of all that, I threw in some genre-specific rankings. So if you're anywhere on my Spotify or YouTube, you can see there's like top 10 MCU films, top 10 Pokemon films, top 10 Disney films, top 10 Pixar, all of those sort of things. Top 8 Tarantino movies, top 12 Christmas movies. There's some some little uh, little bits of fun thrown about in there. Um, and then, of course, doing the actual rankings for the end of every year that I've been doing this podcast. You know, 2020, 21, 22, uh, and there will, of course, be one at the end of this year. I'm currently making my list as we go with the movies that I watch. Uh, to, to be ready when the time comes. So it's been a long time since I've done another go back in time ranking. The last one we did was 2011, and that could almost be a year ago that I did that. Uh, I've done some genre specific ones since then, and I've done my top tens for 2022. But I looked at it as a sort of, how far am I gonna go back? We're we gonna get to a point where I'm going, oh, here are the top 10 movies from 1960. Uh, like who cares about that really, especially I won't have seen enough movies from 1960 probably to do a ranking of sorts. Uh, but I thought looking back, uh, what's interesting about ranking films that came out so long ago for me is how much I have changed since 2010. Making my list for the top 10 movies of 2020, 2020 <laughs> is so different to what I would have ranked uh, at the end of that year when 2020 ended and I ranked my movies there, ludicrously different to what we've got now. In the same way, I always put a little preference before the rankings that I do in real time. So 2020, 2021, 2022, I do say, I haven't seen all the movies that came out this year, and I guarantee you over the next couple of years, I'll see some other movies that came out that year, which will blow me away and would radically alter that list if I were to go back and look at it, which is a reflection on people's tastes, people's aging, um, how people just completely change their likes and dislikes over the years. People who didn't like Brussels sprouts when they were kids like them now, sort of stuff like that. Uh, and looking at my list for 2010 now, I think a majority of the movies that are on the list, I wouldn't have even seen at the end of 2010 when that came out. Back in those days, I wasn't religiously watching all the new movies that came out. I was still very slowly garnering my library of film, my knowledge of what had come out and what will come out. It didn't really properly kick off until probably the middle half of the 2010s. 
So for 2010, like if you had to ask me what movie came out in 2010, what's the best movie from then? And I had to think off the top of my head, the only one I could confidently say that I know came out in 2010 is Iron Man 2 because I'm always going on and on about the bloody MCU films. And I don't really like Iron Man 2 that much, so I wouldn't even want it on my list. So we've gone back. Uh, thanks Wikipedia for listing the top the films that came out in 2010. I've gone through, I've ranked them, I've got a shit ton of honorable mentions like I always do. And I think it's interesting, it's it been fun for me to sort of see, oh, okay, cool. And I think people listening as well, if they are intrigued enough, I know one person who does listen to these specific rankings, they then go, they look up the movies that came out that year, and they go, oh yeah, I remember these movies. They're great, I should rewatch them, or I should make my own list. So if nothing else, it furthers people's knowledge of when movies came out. It tickles that nostalgia in your brain, which makes you either remember seeing these movies, or just 2010 as a year in general. What were you doing in 2010? In 2010, I was in my final year of high school. Uh, very different time. I think I busted my foot that year. Uh, lots of stuff that are escaping me right now because once again, I've been put on the spot and I can't think of a damn thing. Uh, and it's fun. At the end of the day, it's fun. And it's something to do that's not a new movie review or a Christopher Nolan talk. So strap yourselves in for this episode. Quick thing though, as I say before all these things, even though everything I just said earlier about how I've just seen so many movies from this year as the years have gone on, I still have not seen every movie from 2010. And there may be movies that are universally acclaimed that I just haven't seen. So I can't put them on the list just because they have a good reputation. I need to have seen them and liked them. Which brings me to my second point. Everybody's opinions and preferences are different. Just because a movie won a bunch of Academy Awards doesn't necessarily mean that it's the movie for me. Just because everybody else loves a certain movie doesn't mean I'm going to love it. Just because everybody else hates a certain movie doesn't mean I don't love it myself. I am notoriously have a soft spot for what other people consider bad movies. No one's going to agree. Everyone's going to have their different lists. All I ask is that if you disagree with anything on this list, know that I don't care <laughs> and you shouldn't either. And the only way to resolve your bad feelings if you have them is simply to make your own list and share it. Uh, but at the end of the day, let's just respect each other's opinions and just be glad that so many movies exist that we can make such vastly different lists. Okay, moving on because these episodes go very, very, very long. And honestly, I don't know how many of you will stick around for a long episode about 2010 movies. But let's get right into it. We have the top 10 movies for Spliced In Later for 2010. Coming in at number 10, we have Predators, a movie that absolutely would not have been on this list 13 years ago and only recently has probably got on the list. As the Predator franchise, as I probably mentioned on the show before, I lumped in with horror franchises, horror movies, and young, naive, innocent Jordan used to think all horror movies were bad and scary and wouldn't go anywhere near them. But over time, I've allowed myself to very slowly uh, dip my toe into these types of films and see what I think. Predators... I should have known really though, it's less a horror film franchise and more uh, an action with just some horror elements. Uh, the only real horror stuff sort of is when it crosses over with Alien and even then when Predator gets involved it becomes more action orientated. But obviously the Predator franchise is very beloved to people. That original Predator movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger everyone loves. Uh, depending on what you want from a Predator movie will determine how you feel about a specific movie in the franchise, whether you think Predator 2 is the best or the new movie Prey that came out on Disney Plus and Hulu and all of that stuff. For me though, my probably favorite film aside from the new one Prey that came out is Predators. And I put it here on the bottom of the list simply for the entertainment value that I got from it. Now people listening who are big on the Predator franchise might be annoyed that a Predators movie is on the list. They might even be like Predators sucks compared to the others. Uh, but the other movies didn't come out in 2010. And compared to the other movies I saw in 2010, Predators is one that I will absolutely re-watch and I will have as much fun watching it through on a third viewing than I have on the first one. Predators uh, sort of flips the formula of the original Predator uh, setup where a lone Predator comes to Earth and hunts Arnold Schwarzenegger and his commando team. In Predators, you get a group of the worst people you can ever imagine, uh, rapists, criminals, mafia bosses, uh, 
mur uh, murderers, all of those, and they all get dumped on an alien planet. The movie just jumps into high gear. It starts off, they're all falling to the to the planet. They're all like, what's going on? Pretty soon they realize that they are being hunted by predators on this alien planet. So instead of a bunch of humans being hunted on our planet, being hunted by a single predator, it's a bunch of scummy people being hunted on an alien planet with a bunch of predators, which means you've got different physics for planets, uh, you've got different creatures that they can go across. Uh, this is not a tight-knit commando group. These are people that, for the most part, are generally out for themselves. Um, I just really like it. It's one of those things where it's a fun movie where anything can happen. Uh, you don't particularly like these characters, so you're happy if they die horribly until a few of them sort of start to grow on you. You see the ones that are less shittier than the others. Uh, it's directed by Robert Rodriguez, so it's a lot of cool, gory, slasher stuff that you get from his action movies, like Machete, of course. Um, I couldn't tell you too much about the characters themselves, because that's not important. What's important and why it's my number 10 is just, it's a lot of fun. It's just from the moment it kicks off, there's no silly exposition where it's like, oh, you meet our characters all on different parts of Earth doing their things, and you explain how they got to the planet. It's just like, here you go, they're on the planet. And then you sort of learn, on the first viewing, you learn with them what's going on and how they are going to survive what's going on. And then later viewings, you get to go, ah, oh, cool, this is the part where this happens and that happens. Nothing's particularly resolved. I don't know. I believe this was probably going to launch a Predators trilogy, which probably never got off the ground. There's implication that there's more to do. Nobody makes it to Earth by the end of the movie. But it's just fun. I have a really fun time with this movie. And when I go back and I rewatch all the Predator movies, this is the one I look forward to the most. And of all the movies in 2010, this is probably one of the few which is fun to rewatch. There's a lot of heavy stuff in 2010, a lot of very serious biopics or dramas. But if you want just some good, clean, and when I say clean, I mean gory, uh, silly action fun with Predators running about and killing scummy people, this is for you. That's why it's here at number 10. Coming in at number 9, we have The King's Speech. Now, I think the internet has a bit of a rocky history with The King's Speech. I think you either really love it or you hate it. I know it won the Academy Award for Best Picture at the Academy Awards that year. Um, I don't know what it was up against. I believe it was up against the number one movie on my list. But I'm also not that person that's like, only one movie deserves to win and no other should have recognition. If a movie wins... Uh, unless it's a, a controversial sort of thing like Crash or Green Book where the movie itself isn't actually that good and you can't understand why it's in the best pictures uh, at, the end of, at, at the end of it. It's just a celebration of film. The King's Speech, I watched without any of that baggage and I really enjoyed it. And then afterwards, you know, people telling you like, oh, but shouldn't this other movie have win? Don't you think this is just Oscar clickbait? It probably is, but it's still an, it's still an engaging entertaining, in my opinion, fun, powerful, important movie, I guess. It's basically telling the story of King George, played by Colin Firth, who is uh, thrust into the leadership after his brother abdicates uh, and has to be king of England at a very, very turbulent time in English history. But uh, the, the, the rub of the matter is that he has a speeching, speeching problem, just like spliced in latest Jordan. He has a speeching problem. Uh, he, he, is very shy, he's uh, very self-conscious, he stutters over his words, he cannot make speeches, he certainly cannot speak in front of large crowds of people, let alone even speak on the radio. And for the King of England, this is going to be a problem. So his loving wife, played by Helena Bonham Carter, organizes him to have uh, speaking lessons with a very uh, oddballish, unique Australian guy, played by Geoffrey Rush who forms this wonderful relationship with King George as they tackle not just his inability to speak, but his own insecurities, uh, how to make him more confident in general, to believe in himself to be king, all of that sort of stuff, all that very self-help, feel-good sort of thing. I love the performances in here, uh, not just from the serious stuff where Colin first really worrying that he's going to fail the kingdom, but Geoffrey Rush is just this really funny, funny guy. He's just like really entertaining in how he breaks through a very standoffish King George. King George doesn't want anything to do with him in the beginning, and by the end there's a begrudging respect between the two. One could say friendship, 
Uh, but who knows? With biopics, it's always a little overblown of how the relationship actually was. You get some fun uh, go-the-distance moments. It's like a montage that you get from Rocky, but instead it's learning how to speak <laughs> properly. Uh, all culminating in, of course, the big speech that King George must make, which is probably very famous. And if I knew more about history, and if I had a clearer head right now, I'd probably be able to tell you exactly what it is, but I don't care. I don't really care about what the important part in history is that the King's speech is sort of focusing on. It's the character development and the fun that you get between Colin Firth and Jeffrey Rush. Again, very rewatchable film. Uh, I don't know if it deserved to win Best Film at the Academy Awards that year, but it's certainly deserving of being recognized as a good film, and it comes in at my list at number nine. All right, so coming in at number eight is The Social Network, a little P BT dubs or whatever, a little warning before this one. It sound, probably sounds a little different from the rest of the recording. Uh, I had originally picked The Girl on the Train as number eight, but I've just discovered, putting together the episode, that the girl on the train that came out in 2010 is not the girl on the train I was thinking of, which actually came out in 2016, and which I have already put on a top 10 movies of 2016. So there you go. Uh, so I had to I had to pick another one. So instead, we've got The Social Network. Uh, I have an interesting relationship with The Social Network. I kind of don't want to like it because of Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook as a whole, and just how shitty it is. But I think what's good about the social network is that it's not a it's not a flattering portrayal of Zuckerberg or how Facebook operates or the people behind it or how it's affected people in certain ways. And it is a very well made movie with very good performances, so I think it's definitely deserving to be on this list here at number eight. But as I said, it's basically it's the origin story of Facebook created by Mark Zuckerberg, played here by Jesse Eisenberg. He has this idea. It starts off as something very petty where a girl dumps him. So he starts ranking the girls in his college by by essence of hotness, uh, which sort of takes off. And then using that as a launching point, he realizes, oh yeah, um, the socialness of it all, I could turn this into something even bigger. So his best friend, Andrew Garfield, uh, he starts, apologies, I just knocked something over there. Uh, he starts building Facebook and in true Zuckerberg fashion, it's scorched earth. He makes alliances and then he betrays people. He steals ideas and then claims them as his own. And there's an arrogance to him that it's, what's great about it is it's the showcasing of how the guy who created the ultimate social networking platform where everybody can talk to everybody uh, and everybody can reach and communicate each other in new ways is in essence completely incapable of doing that himself in real life, whether it's with potential romantic relationships, with uh, rival business partners, or even his own friends. Uh, at the end of it all, he's all about uh, how things affect him. He's very self-centered. And by the end of it, yeah, he's made Facebook and it's revolutionized social media and the internet and how we all communicate with each other and the way we operate will have forever changed. But so will his relationships with his best friend and his, his life and the way people talk to him and all that. Uh, I don't know if Zuckerberg likes this film or not. I would feel like he doesn't. And I don't really like Jesse Eisenberg, but I think he has a really good portrayal of the the machinations of Zuckerberg and how it into, went into Facebook and all of that. Uh, great performances as well from Andrew Garfield and a few other people involved in here. Um, it is an engaging film for something as what seems pretty boring as just, oh, we just built Facebook. Uh, they really turn it into this quite exciting, interesting, engaging uh, roller coaster film where you're intrigued by how Facebook came about, but you feel dirty for watching these people backstab each other and just really step all over each other just to get this thing going and to make money. Uh, so in essence, though it's not the girl on the train, which is a better film in my opinion, The Social Network is a worthy substitution for it and comes in at number eight. Moving on to your originally, originally recorded program. At number seven, a uh, cult classic animated film Megamind from DreamWorks. Megamind unfortunately wouldn't go on to build the franchise that so many other DreamWorks films did, like Shrek and Madagascar, How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda. But it should have. I don't know why it didn't. I guess because it was a box office disaster, so I hear. I guess not a lot of people saw it. Uh, but everybody knows about it and everybody loves it. So hopefully it might get like a chicken run sort of thing where after a while the powers that be behind DreamWorks will go, well, if we make a Megamind movie, Megamind 2 might actually get something. 
Megamind is a is is definitely something that plays on my interest too because it's in that superhero sort of world. Basically, Megamind, voiced by Will Ferrell, is a supervillain, and he's also always going up against Brad Pitt's superhero. They are locked in an eternal struggle, but it's Will Ferrell, so it's it's silly and stupid. He's got silly plans for global domination. He's got uh, David Cross as his little fish-headed uh, minion, uh, but then one day he sort of accidentally succeeds, and Brad Pitt's superhero was completely out of the picture. Uh, realizing that all he had was their uh, their rivalry, their relationship with each other, Megamind is a bit driftless, he doesn't know what to do, so he decides to create a new superhero that he can then fight and get things back to normal, where he recruits a, a Budoi Jonah Hill to be that new role. Unfortunately, things don't go particularly well, Jonah Hill turns out to be an asshole, turns into a super duper super villain, Megamind has to then realize that he can be a superhero while at the same time having a very strange uh, romantic relationship with Brad Pitt's uh, former girlfriend uh, it's a lot of fun it's got great animation it's got that classic DreamWorks edge to it it's a unique spin that on superhero stories and the hero villain relationship and it also leans heavily into why Will Ferrell's comedy is generally still loved as much as it is maybe not as much as it used to be but he has this manicness to him which works perfectly for a mega mind character a super villain like that he really isn't a super villain try as he might he's a good guy at heart uh, i like there's some twists and turns in here as well things aren't always exactly as it seems there's the smoke and mirrors going on but generally it's a really 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 well-made animated movie with a good morale good character development and entertainment for all ages and i think uh, most people know this, which is why it's a cult classic. If more people had seen it, maybe we'd have more of it. If you haven't seen Megamind, definitely check it out. Number seven. Coming in at number six, we have Easy A. Uh, a very funny comedy from a, a young Emma Stone before she really blew up and became the Hollywood sensation that she is. Easy A is one of those uh, school comedies in the same vein of, of Mean Girls. Uh, which focuses on Emma Stone's character. She's a an average person at school. It's I will say though, it's always frustrating when you get these movies and they have like Emma Stone and Lindsay Lohan, and they set them up like, oh, these plain Janes. You know, they're 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 not popular in school, and they and they don't look that visually appealing compared to other girls. I was like, what are you talking about? Emma Stone looks and always will be beautiful. So was Lindsay Lohan and probably still is. Anyway, that's a whole other thing, whatever. Uh, anyway, that was a little side tangent in there. But basically, your plain Jane Emma Stone character who is pretty much drifting through school, not causing trouble, uh, good student, good friend to people who, who bother to be her friend, to help out another friend who is gay but doesn't want people to know he's gay. Uh, she pretends that she slept with him. Uh, and it's it's kind of like a, how a rumor sort of spirals at school. Uh, she gains a reputation, uh, things spiral out of control, the rumor gets bigger, more outlandish, she sort of helps more people but gets in over her head in that regard. Her relationships changes, her result, her best friend hates her, her mortal enemy has some stuff going on there, has some issues with her teachers and her, uh, her school counselor. And then of course it all comes to a head where Emma Stone has to be like, okay, maybe the lesson here is don't lie. Uh, be who you are. Uh, don't worry what other people think of you as well though. All the general morals that you get from these movies and are important for people in school to remember as well because school is not important. What people think of you in school is not important. Uh, those clicks that you fall into, that reputation you have will not last past graduation. So be who you are that's all that matters very empowering movie that's got that uh tina fey style humor very self-aware of how schools work uh, a little risque humor a little silliness that you wouldn't get for normal school but is just fun because you can sort of relate to what's going on and very dry very comedic performances especially from like stanley tucci as emma stone's father her parents are just so strange i love them but Emma Stone, of course, she owns this movie, much like Emily Blunt, it really showcases her acting ability, her emotional range, even for something as simple as this silly high school comedy. Easy A, very rewatchable. Rewatched it quite a few times since I only watched it for the first time a few years ago, and well deserving of its spot at number six. Coming in at number five, a Martin Scorsese film. Probably not Martin Scorsese's most revered film, 
but definitely one of my favorites from him. It is Shutter Island, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, another thriller mystery film in the style of Emily Blunt. And also another film which the poster looked scary, so I didn't go watch it. Uh, but it's not a horror film. Uh, there's, there's stuff that will make your skin crawl and make you feel uncomfortable, but not in a horror-esque. It's more trying to understand what's going on in this film. I unfortunately knew the twists that were coming in this film before I saw it, so I will never know what it was like to watch this film and not know what was going to happen and be blown away by what was about to happen. But even if you know what you know, it's still an absolutely entertaining watch by far. So it's set in like the 1930s, I believe, but it follows Leonardo DiCaprio as our main character. Uh, he is a police detective that's uh, coming to an island where a mental hospital is very isolated uh, from the rest of the world. He's headed there with his partner, Mark Ruffalo, to solve a murder that has been committed there. Uh, but once he gets there, uh, everything goes off the rails very quickly. Things don't line up with how he perceives things, what, what he is being told. He has patients which don't seem to exist. He's got uh, people disappearing and reappearing. Some people appear dead and then alive. Something's going on with Mark Ruffalo, the partner as well. And you have our very shifty Ben Kingsley uh, warden or head doctor on the island. There's certainly a conspiracy going on that DiCaprio has to unravel. And the digger he deeps, the digger he deeps, the deeper he digs, the more he sort of realizes that something truly fucked up is going on. Uh, and that it involves him and his previous life with his wife and all of that, who uh, their relationship is kind of on the rocks when he arrives on the rocks on the island there. Uh, even when you think you know what's going on, there's still twists and turns until there's a point where the rug is pulled out from under you. Uh, very infamous twist in the vein of like the Sixth Sense M. Night Shyamalan sort of twist where it doesn't seem to make sense at first and if you think hard you can probably pluck holes into it but it doesn't matter because it's the execution and it's the delivery of the performances and DiCaprio's unraveling of his mental state which is um, a truly mesmerizing watch for sure. As I said, I don't know what it would have been like to experience this movie not know what was going to happen but knowing what was going to happen it was still like a, an engaging film that i couldn't look away from and it's fun for me to rewatch as well and try and pick up even more little clues to sort of go oh yeah this was always hinting at this okay this makes more sense um definitely in the vein for my my murder mystery itch uh for psychological thrillers that really deconstruct a person's psyche what makes a person tick the morality that there's always a little bit of gray in everybody. Everybody's not completely good or completely bad. Um, everybody's like the Joker, that one bad day away from doing something terrible. Uh, and this movie really showcases how that can have such an effect on people and people around you. Shutter Island's fantastic. One of Scorsese's underlooked films, in my opinion, and definitely worth checking out at number five. At number four, we have Scott Pilgrim versus The World, a truly Wonderful film from Edgar Wright. I believe I've talked a little bit about it when I've talked about other Edgar Wright films on this show, specifically Last Night in Soho and Shaun of the Dead. But Edgar Wright has a very fun, uh, unique style, which works perfectly with the Scott Pilgrim comics that this is adapted from. Uh, it stars Michael Cera, unique for Michael Cera to play a role like this. Uh, he plays Scott Pilgrim. He's this little dweeby kid. He's in a band. Uh, he's sort of dating this girl, but clearly it's it's more they don't really have anything going on there uh, And then one day at a party he sees Ramona Flowers who he instantly falls in love with and wants to date and after a while he does successfully uh, Establish a day of boyfriend and girlfriend, but oh no Ramona Flowers actually has seven evil exes who have all vowed to kill Scott uh, and these exes range from very wild personalities you get your your Chris Evans, your Brandon Ralph, your Jason Schwartzman, your Wayne May Whitman. Uh, but the uniqueness of this movie is it's shot in the style of like a video game, much like the inspiration from the comics. So it's very meta, it's very 4 4 breaking. There's uh, power ups and special swords, and like Scott unlocked the power of love, like that sort of thing. Um, and it's just, it's kind of like a fever dream if you're not prepared for it. But it's just so much fun and so interesting and such a unique style of film that you don't get in a lot of other movies for sure. For comic book adaptions, Scott Pilgrim's definitely one of the perfect ones that has been 
done. Uh, it's got a stacked cast as well of up and coming actors at the time. You've got your Brie Larson's in here, Aubrey Plaza, Anna Kendrick, uh, Kieran Culkin. There's this, there's all sorts of actors doing all sorts of different things. Uh, and nobody feels wasted. Everybody has a very unique personality, which contrasts completely with Michael Cera. But at the end of the day, Michael Cera completely sells it as Scott and Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Ramona. And their relationship, while odd and strange, is very believable. And you're rooting for them to be together and for Scott to succeed in this video game world that he lives in, for sure. Uh, rewatchable, I've said that a lot in all these movies, but you know scott pilgrim you can put that in feeling the lowest of the low like absolute dog shit and by the end of it you'll be like that was fun oh look there's a smile on my face perhaps life isn't so bad scott pilgrim versus the world number four coming in at number three inception i'm not going to talk too much about inception because that's actually going to be my next christopher nolan episode which will only be coming out in a couple of weeks and i feel like i'll be reiterating myself uh, so we'll sum it up very quickly. Inception is probably Christopher Nolan's most successful uh, Hollywood-style movie, aside from the Batman movies, just in terms of both box office success and uh, critical reception. Uh, all this film also stars DiCaprio, and he is a man called Cobb who uh, has a unique job where he performs uh, heists, but in people's dreams. And in this one, uh, instead of stealing something from someone's mind in a dream, He's been hired by Ken Watanabe to implant an idea into Killian Murphy, which will help Ken Watanabe's business plans. So he forms a little team with Tom Hardy and Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Elliot Page, uh, and they dive down into these dreams. But uh, to go down far enough to plant this idea, they've got to go through different layers of dreams with different rules for how it works and the different times. But DiCaprio is also being hunted by a version of his wife, who uh, may or may not have died, most likely did, but is definitely messing with his mind. Uh, yeah, I'll go more into it when we talk about Inception in a few weeks, but this was like a, a movie where I knew nothing about it going in, and then it was just like, one, I was completely blown away with the execution of the idea of dreams and heists from dreams and layers on layers of dreams and that sort of stuff. And also the direction, the intensity of the situation, uh, nothing ever let up. It's a long movie, but you never feel bored or aimless. Uh, and great characters. This was my first introduction to Tom Hardy. I didn't know who Tom Hardy was. I never heard of him. Didn't know he was from the worst Star Trek movie of all time. But his Ames character, I was just like, this guy has great screen presence. He's interesting. He's likable uh, in an asshole sort of way. I'd love to see more of him. And then a few years later, he was kicking Batman's butt as Bane. Again, I will go more into Inception at a later date, but it is almost my favorite Christopher Nolan film and definitely the one that I think if I wanted to introduce people to Christopher Nolan movies, this would probably be the safest one to do to get them to watch more. But there you go, Inception number three. Coming in at number two, the movie that made all of us uh, cry uh, question our life and reevaluate where we were in 2010 uh, if you had been a kid when the first movie came out is Toy Story 3. The at the time the conclusion to the Toy Story trilogy in this movie we checked in with Woody and Buzz and friends after 10 years maybe 8 I can't remember I think Toy Story 2 came out in 2002. Uh, Andy's almost grown up much like us who watched Toy Story we were grown up heading off to college uh, so what becomes of Woody and friends? Well they end up at a at a Sunnyside daycare run by Lotsa Hug and Bear, played by Ned Beatty. Everything seems okay, except that Woody does not like it. He wants to go back to Andy because Andy is his kid and he has such a loyalty to that boy. Uh, while he's trying to do that though, the reality that Lotso has like a, a gulag dictatorship run over toys uh, in this place based on a very, very tragic backstory uh, means for Buzz and friends, it's an absolute nightmare. Uh, everybody has to try and escape, to try and get back to Andy, have to beat Lotso, avoid a point where they're all about to go into a furnace and they just hold hands and accept their fate. We'll never forget that scene. And then of course, the most iconic part of the movie where Andy goes off to college, but hands his toys over to young Bonnie and sort of lets go of his childhood, acknowledges that it was important to him and moves on to a new point in time. 
not only is it very just like a very good movie in general just an exciting uh movie full of action and emotion and great vocal performances from tom hanks and co and just great to check in with the toy story world but it resonates with so many people on so many different ways depending on who you were when you watched that movie as i said if you were a kid when toy story came out you watched this movie and you came to terms with how you had grown up and what you were about to do of your life and your childhood was over and it got you emotional if you were a parent who took your kid to go see toy story you watch this film and realize that your kids have grown up and are about to become adults and move on their childhood is over your obligation as a parent for them in that part of their life is over and you cry and if you're a little kid who's never seen any other toy story movies you'll be like this is fun i like these characters and you got toy story 4 after this so you got to essentially be bonnie you got to take on the toy story characters for the future not that the rest of us will ever stop watching toy story i'll be 72 and if there's toy story 8 i'll be there watching that great comedy like you got spanish buzz in here uh, the animation had stepped up tremendously since the first toy story films which was a delight to watch all of woody's side characters get to do something i like when they get rex and ham and mr potato head and jesse involved in these plots and of course that moment when the toys were about to go into that furnace and you generally thought that was it and they just held hands and accept fate we're all going to die together that's nuts for her for an animated film for kids what are you doing to me emotions i don't know how to deal with that for a long time toy story 3 was my number one film of the year but it has just been edged out i think by just how my uh preferences have changed for movies and what i want out of movies and I think the number one film just edges this out. But on any other day, Toy Story 3 could absolutely reclaim its spot. For now, it sits here at number two. Before we get into our final movie, here are the honorable mentions. The 11 movies that did not make the cut despite getting very close. The Book of Eli, Denzel Washington in a post-apocalyptic world. Uh, good action movie with a good final twist. How to Train Your Dragon, the one of the most successful DreamWorks franchises of all time. Kicked off... A great uh, evolution of characters with Hiccup and Toothless. Kick-Ass, a very violent comic film, which is just like kind of like Scott Pilgrim, a lot of fun. It was Deadpool before Deadpool. Iron Man 2 gets an honorable mention because as much as I think it's inferior compared to the other MCU films, it helped start to build that cinematic universe. So it is important to acknowledge that. Get Him to the Greek, a very manic comedy film that's a spin-off of Forgetting Sarah Marshall where Jonah Hill tries to get Russell Brand to go perform. I think I love it for the music, if anything else. The A-Team, I've never seen the original A-Team, but maybe one day I should because I really liked how the A-Team was executed in this remake with Liam Neeson. And it was my first introduction to Charlto Copley, Copley, who's a really fantastic actor. Despicable Me, the movie which made everybody aware of minions and and thrust them into our life for the rest of our lives but behind all that is a very emotional story about a supervillain who adopts some kids and learns to love them the expendables uh, a love letter to action movies of the 80s and all those old old former action stars all coming together to kick ass together unstoppable denzel again teamed up with chris pine on a on a story based on a real event when they had to stop a runaway train harry potter and the deathly hallows part one not part two part one starts the story off good for harry's final adventure the only issue is that of course because it's a part one the story does feel uh, unfinished and tangled the beginning maybe the beginning i like i think the princess and the frog really is but tangles the full beginning of the revival for disney uh, i remember people were like oh it's a rapunzel movie it's for the little girls but not at all it's an incredible beautifully animated movie with great performances from Mandy Moore and Zachary Levi and really meant Disney is still something to watch to take notice of up. when they really pull it together they can create some masterpieces and it kicked off uh, a good run of masterpieces from there but finally our number one film of 2010 it goes to True Grit which yes is a remake of a movie that came out yonks ago starring John Wayne which I have not seen, but if it's anything like this one, then I'm sure it's really great too. Uh, a unique thing about Westerns is you never really see them anymore. Back in the day when Hollywood was really kicking into gear in the 20s and 30s and all of that, uh, Westerns were everywhere, whether they were being made in America or spaghetti Westerns overseas, 
people couldn't get enough of them. It's why it's how Clint Eastwood became as famous as he is. But over time, interest in them obviously dwindled. Box office success for them, not so much. So westerns died out. Very rarely do you get a western these days. But when you get one, they tend to be really good, mainly because the people who are making them obviously really want to do a good western. The people involved put in good performances. But it's also a an interesting period to focus on. I generally am interested in westerns. I like that view of the frontier and, and cowboys and, and all of that stuff going on. And I think people generally have a want for them. If anything, of the love of the Red Dead games is anything to go by. But for me, my first real uh, look at a western and how good westerns can be is True Grit. It's an interesting tale. You've got Hayley Steinfeld as a young girl who hires crusty old Rooster Cogburn, played by Jeff Bridges, an eyepatch-wearing, drunkard cowboy. She wants him to help her find the man that killed her father and kill him. Uh, they are begrudgingly forced together. Matt Damon comes along for the ride and they go to hunt Josh Brolin. Uh, nothing goes the way you expect. It's not a Hollywood style. They get the bad guy and, and, and they decide, Rooster decides to adopt the girl and they have a happy ending after him. It's very matter of fact how life was in the West at that point, how people operated, how they spoke to each other, the very brutal violence of it all, not over the top gory, but just how one minute everything can be fine and then a second later someone's lost their fingers. It's mesmerizing. That's the best way to, to describe it. The performances in here, the way the dialogue is written, the interactions between people, the beautiful landscapes of the West that everybody travels around in, um, the, un the psychological unpacking of Rooster Cogburn and Matt Damon and Haley Steinfeld, even Josh Brolin, when you finally get involved with him. Uh, it's just an in truly engrossing film that just makes you go, Westerns are cool. I would like to be in a Western, but I would not like to live in a Western. Uh, the first time Haley Steinfeld really came on the scene as well. The first time I think Josh Brolin really got out from some shitty films that he'd made before this. But something which by the end of it, you're not sure how you feel. You go through a lot of emotions watching this film. You feel comedy, you feel sadness, you feel disgust, you feel betrayal, you feel melancholy. And by the end of it, you're just sort of like, I don't know how I feel, but I know what happened should always have happened the way that it did. Uh, and I like it. I really like it. And I rewatched True Grid a few more times, and I always get a little bit more out of it every time after that. Um, don't get me wrong, Toy Story 3 is great for the reasons that I said. But just for how my tastes have evolved, how I appreciate film, how film is made and my love of the art form, I think True Grit for me sort of shows how my interests have changed and how what I want from a movie can also be terrible, violent things where nobody has a happy ending, but that's okay because uh, I had a good time watching it, I suppose. Anyway, True Grit, number one. There you are. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed going 13 years into the past and ranking the top 10 movies of 2010. As I said, this is my list, this isn't yours. If you disagree with my list, could not care less. But feel free to make your own list. Go back to those archives. Hopefully you've listened to some of these movies and been like, I remember those movies. I'll go back and rewatch them. Or I've never even heard of those movies. I'll have to give them a go. Or I haven't mentioned any movie you wanted me to and you're inspired to make your own list just so you can give them that recognition that they so truly deserve. Um, I'll be back later this week for a very anticipated review of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I'm very excited for that film. God, I hope it's as good as the first one. I have a feeling it will be. But until then, stay safe, be kind to one another, look after yourselves, and I will catch you next time. You've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. Yeah.